thing. Well, again, I'm Pastor Chris. I'm so glad that you are here today joining us at Glory Baptist Church. We are continuing on with a a, a relatively short sermon series. We are looking at uh, some of the stories from the prophet in the Old Testament, Elijah. Elijah, you'll find most of the information about him in 1 Kings. And today we're going to primarily be in 1 Kings 19. If you didn't bring a Bible, that's okay. There's some in the chairs below you. We have some in the Welcome Center. And the other thing that you can always do, if you have a, a smartphone, you feel free to open that up and, and look up on Uversion. Uh, Uversion is a great app that will give you the Bible and uh, lots of other tools. If you need some devotional reading or you want to read through the Bible or anything like that, Uversion has a bunch of tools to equip you to do that. And so if you've not found that before, Uversion is a, a great, great tool. So uh, we're going to be looking at Elijah. As I said, we're going to be in First Kings 19. And so here we go. Buckle in. Let's go. Um, there was a, a class of psychiatry students and in college. And one day their professor began a discussion with them with the intent of trying to prove a point to them. He said, what we're going to talk about today is uh, we're going to look at emotional extremes, the things that many mentally disturbed people go through. For example, he said, he said, what is the opposite of joy? Well, one student raised his hand and said sadness. He said, correct. The professor Walked around a little bit more and he said, What is the opposite of depression? A brave young lady raised her hand and she said, Elation? Correct, he said. Turning to a young man in the front row from Texas, he said, What is the opposite of woe? He said, Well now, I suppose the opposite of woe would probably be giddy up. (laughs) Right? Depends on your perspective, I suppose. But according to psychiatrists uh, Frank Minrath and, and Paul Meyer, the majority of Americans suffer at some point in their lives from, from serious and, and clinical depression at some point. Almost every one of us does. And the truth of the matter is most people never get help. They just fight this battle on their own. And for for many, many years, the holy grail of psychiatrists has been to to find the magic pill, that that, that powerful potion that will correct our imbalances and give people everywhere relief from from the dark moments of life, from sadness, from that feeling of hopelessness that many people at various times do experience. And I think many of us know that, that depression is a very real part of life for many people. Now, these two uh, psychiatrists, they they run a a wide network of clinics. And at this Minrith Meyer set of clinics, they average over 50,000 people in a given week who will come in and see one of their counselors for therapy. And 75% of those clients, says Dr. Meyer, will either have clinical depression or some sort of anxiety disorder. We know that depression can be a very real problem. And a problem we lots of times don't talk much about. And what I find interesting is, is that as we read our Bible, God gives us actually a case study of clinical depression right here in 1 King 19. And from this text, we're going to find that Elijah experienced many of the classic symptoms. First, he had fear. It says in in 1 Kings 19.3, Elisha was afraid and he ran for his life. Elisha had some suicidal tendencies. It says, Elisha prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he had said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. 1 Kings 19.4. Elijah experienced excessive tiredness. It says in 1 Kings 19.5 that then he laid down under a tree and he fell asleep. and, And he slept for an extended period of time. In fact, a couple of days, most likely. Elijah experienced feelings of rejection. He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant and broken down your altars and put your prophet to death with, your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, he says, and now they're trying to kill me too. And he experiences depression. For, for probably a couple, two, three months, we see as we read through this story. 
Now, if you weren't here last week, you don't know this, but what's bizarre about this is this comes right on the heels, just days after Elijah had preached what was probably the greatest sermon of his entire life. As we learned last week, he confronted over 400 different prophets of the false god Baal. And he he confronted them on top of Mount Carmel, and he exposed them as the, the, the false prophets that they really were. And because of Elijah's faith and because of his obedience to God, God literally sent down fire from the heavens that consumed the offering. But not only did it consume the offering, it it melted the stone the altar was made of. It boiled away all of the water that they had dumped on top of it beforehand just to kind of make their point, right? And then after that, God sent rain, and you need to know, it hadn't rained for over three years because that was part of the judgment that God was using against the people of Israel. And so this is like a highlight day of of a man's life, right? And, And why would a man who had just experienced this, who had just preached such a powerful, impressive message, who had literally seen God respond to his prayers right in front of him to turn the nation of Israel, who had seen some of the most powerful displays of God's power in all of history, why, why would he suddenly now be crippled by fear, and hopelessness, and despair? Why, why would he run away to a desolate corner of the world and, and literally seek to die? There's probably all kinds of different reasons. But the fact is, he did. And what this tells us is that even God's most dynamic servants can suffer from depression. And it's not necessarily a lack of faith. It's not necessarily the mark of an immoral lifestyle. Elijah was the man of God in his day. And now... In chapter 19 of 1 Kings, he's so far down in the depths of despair, even up looks wrong to him. But that's not where God left him. You see, God didn't say, well, sorry Elijah, you, know, you have a chemical imbalance, Paxil hasn't been invented yet, so I just can't help you. Right? No, that's not what God does. You see, long before psychiatry was ever even thought of, long, long before healing could be brought about by, by little pills and chemicals, and long before we had clinics and psychiatrists and psychologists, long before all of that, God healed a man of his depression, and it wasn't just a, a one-time kind of deal. What God did for Elijah, he can and does still do today. If you're following along in 1 Kings 19, notice what God did to heal Elijah. First, God recognized that Elijah, he had depression, and it wasn't an imaginary problem. You'll see that in your notes if you're taking notes today. Elijah's Elijah's depression was real. And God didn't say, Elijah, just get a hold of yourself, right? This is a sinful latitude. Where's your faith, man? No, that's not what God did. God didn't treat Elijah roughly while he was suffering. In answer to Elijah's prayer to die, what God does is God lets him sleep. Okay? And then, after he slept for a while, God has an angel feed him and then lets him sleep some more. And then God sends him down into the desert, down into the south, for 40 days and for 40 nights. And in all of that time, God doesn't say a word to his prophet Elijah. God doesn't offer him any counsel whatsoever. God doesn't sit him down and say, Elijah, we've got to have a face-to-face talk. In all of that time, Elijah is left alone. Elijah is giving time to, to rest, rejuvenate, and to think. There were no sermons for him, no long counseling sessions. Just love, provision, and rest. Eventually, God did deal with Elijah's depression, though. And and I want you to notice what he did. First, God sent him to a place of worship. Second, God had Elijah tell him what the problem was. We'll get back to all these, don't worry. Third, God dealt with the false beliefs and the false ideas 
that were fueling Elijah's depression. And then lastly, God gave Elijah something to do. So first, as I said, God sent Elijah to a place of worship. God sends Elijah to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God where the law had been given to Moses. A a place of worship is one of the very best, if not the best, places to deal with depression. And when church is done right, it's a place where we come together, we gather to listen to one another, to hear from one another, and to help and serve and love one another. Galatians 6, 2, right? It says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, a number of years ago, Duke University conducted a a survey of nearly 4,000 older adults. And one of the conclusions that they made from that survey was attendance at a house of worship that wasn't just churches, but attendance at a house of worship is related to lower rates of depression and anxiety. So, congratulations for coming today. (laughs) But you see, the church doesn't stop with being a, a house of worship because there's more to it than just that. It's spending time alone with God, time studying the Bible, time in prayer. All of those things they found were were powerful antidepressants as well. Andrew Newberg, the director of clinical nuclear medicine at the University of Pittsburgh, he studied the, the different regions in our brains. And one of the things he looked at were the brains of people who prayed and meditated regularly and those who didn't. And he did a study, and he found in that study a dramatic increase in action in the front region of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. Uh, An increased activity in that region of the brain. And that region is associated with judgment and empathy. Those who spent more time in, in prayer and those who spent more time in meditation, he found more activity there. More ability to make good choices and more ability to have empathy for others. And this group also discovered a decrease in activity in the region of the brain known as the superior parietal lobe. And and what that does is that gives us our sense of self. And so their, their findings seem to indicate that while people are engaged in spiritual pursuits, you would increase your feelings for other and decrease your feelings for self. And Newberg went on to say that that prayer and meditation have been shown to lower the risk of depression, heart disease, as well as improve immune function. So it seems almost logical at first that, that God sends Elijah to a place of worship. Now the second thing God did here is that God has Elijah tell him what the problem was, right? God asked Elijah in 1 Kings 19, 13, Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing here? Now, God doesn't ask this question just once, but he actually asks it twice. Elijah, what are you doing here? I mean, didn't God know? Of course he knew. He'd sent Elijah to this place, right? But Elijah needed to vocalize what was wrong in his life. Elijah needed to explain what he thought were his problems. And once Elijah verbalized his belief of what was wrong, it was then that God began to deal with his false beliefs, the false ideas that had been fueling Elijah's depression. Elsewhere in the Bible, Jesus says, the truth shall set you free, right? Why is that? Well, the reason truth can set us free is because False ideas and false beliefs, when they get into our brains, they have the power to put us into bondage. And our lives are are, are built around what we think is true about life. And if the foundation of that reasoning is based off of wrong information or wrong impressions, the results can be devastating. And so Elijah's response to God reveals what Elijah had wrong. 
If you're looking at your Bibles, this comes in 1914, 1 Kings 19.14. It says, Elijah didn't think that God was doing anything. Right? You ever been there before? Ever felt like God wasn't doing something in your life or doing something for you or dealing with whatever was going on? God, where are you? You're not doing anything. That's what Elijah felt like. And Elijah replied to God and said, God, I've, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites, they've rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with a sword, and I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Right? Can you hear the indignation in, in Elijah's voice? And hidden in the midst of this statement was an accusation. He's saying, I've been beating my head against the wall, serving you, Lord, and everything just seems to be falling apart here. What have you been doing, God? And so God subtly, gently, but rightly corrects Elijah's thinking. He tells Elijah, buddy, you're not the only one left. First Kings 19, God tells Elijah, I have reserved... 7,000 in Israel. So you're not the only one, pal. 7,000 whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and all whose mouths have not kissed him. You're not in this on your own. God seems to be saying to Elijah that not only has he not been standing back and ignoring the situation, but in fact the opposite is true, that God is actually in control. Read in 1 Kings 19, 15 through 17. God says, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, anoint Hazazel the king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, who will secede you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the horde of Hazazel. And Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. And what does that mean? What it means in other words is, Don't worry about it, Elijah. I've got this. That's what God is saying to him. I've got this under control. I am doing something, even though you don't see it. And you see, when a a person is depressed, it's easy to begin to think, to feel, to believe that God isn't doing much of anything, right? Right? Because they have no hope. They have no confidence. And in that moment, God isn't easy for them to see. A person in depression needs to realize that just like Elijah, God is in fact working. Working in their lives, even when we can't see that work. So God got Elijah to a place of worship to get the healing process going. And then he got Elijah to tell him what was wrong. And then God corrected some of Elijah's false thinkings and beliefs. And then the final thing that God does is he gives Elijah something to do. See, when God kind of finishes up this counseling session with Elijah, Elijah's still kind of in a whiny, complaining mood. I mean, he's an Israelite. Kind of comes with the territory, I think. But God basically tells him, Elijah, get back to work. I've got a job for you, dude. I've got a job for you to do. Go and make yourself useful. I mean, the Lord says to him, Elijah, go back the way you came. You know, you've already been there before. Go back the way you came. Go through the desert of Damascus, and when you get there, anoint this guy, anoint that guy, and do this and do that. And and I've got an understudy who's going to come up and take your place. I have this all planned out. I have this taken care of. Get to work. Go at it. Now, psychiatrists and psychologists and little pills can do wonderful, amazing things for people who are suffering from depression. And and, and I'm truly, absolutely thankful for modern medicine. But it's hard to beat the real healing that only God can provide. It's hard to top that. No one's immune from despair. But God is always ready to strengthen us, to encourage us, and to give us a fresh vision of himself. It may not be spectacular like Elijah has, 
But we still have to listen to that still small voice and be ready to take on whatever challenges God places before us. Elijah's flight after this victory that he had over these prophets of Baal show us his humanness. These prophets were like the bigwigs, the spiritual leaders. They were the voice of God to the people of Israel. But, but yet, in this story, we see he's still just a man like you and me. And like us, even after great triumphs, he had a time of, of depression. Elijah's up at Mount Carmel is followed by a desperate down. And I, and I think this passage is incredibly helpful in several ways. First, it helps us realize that the people of the Bible, sometimes we put them up on a pedestal, but they were just like us. They were mortal. They had problems just like we do. I mean, often we identify them and think of them as these spiritual giants. Like, like they are so much greater than us that we can't learn from their lives. But that's not true. We can learn so much from them. The second thing we can see is this, out of this chapter here in 19, is we see how God gently deals with Elijah when he's struggling. See, God doesn't rebuke him, but instead offers him comfort and support. So much needed when we're hurting. We need not be ashamed of our own times where we're struggling, whether it's depression or whatever else. And we need to know that we can turn to Christ, who truly does understand and care. And then third, in the model of God's care for Elijah, you and I can learn how we can be helpful to our friends and to our families and those who they themselves may be struggling as well. For us as Christians, power to overcome discouragement comes ultimately through Christ, through the presence of the Holy Spirit within the believer's life. And what he does is he supernaturally reinforces our lives, comes into us and gives us the love and care and support that we need to overcome whatever is before us. We never walk the path alone. Christ Jesus came to the earth and walked as we walked and has suffered as we have suffered and far beyond anything we could ever experience. And he knows the paths that we have tread and we can lean into that. And when we get too focused on our, our temporary circumstances, what happens is then we begin to sink into the water just like Peter did when he took his eyes off of Christ. Begin to look at the waves and see the problems and the challenges instead of the one who came to conquer the problems of the world. But when our eyes are focused on the eternal one, when we do that, there is courage for us to see it through. For a while at least, Elijah had forgotten that eternal perspective. And he had focused his vision on the discouraging circumstances that were surrounding him. And it's no wonder that he was down. But when God revealed himself in the power of his stillness and his presence, Elijah was then again able to focus his perspective on the eternal. And his time of depression passed. Folks, Jesus understands what we are going through. And he can lead you through whatever it is, whatever you are going through, or whatever you might someday go through. He's gone there before, and he'll go there with you again. Keep your focus on him. Let's pray. God, again, we are humbled and amazed and thankful for the examples out of the Bible that relate so well to the struggles that probably each and every one of us experience. And Lord, we may not be struggling today, but we've struggled before. We'll probably struggle again in the future. Because this world is broken by sin. It's a mess. There's problems. Suffering. Things not the way that you wanted them to be. 
But God, we are reminded as we come this day to the communion table, we are reminded of your great love for us. Lord, we see in your word the uniqueness of you as our God. That through Jesus Christ, you have given the ultimate sacrifice. That we might be reconciled to you. That the brokenness of this world doesn't have to continue on forever. That you had a plan before we even knew. And so God, in this day, I just pray for those who have struggled emotionally, physically. Those who wonder where you might have been. Lord, open our eyes, give us a new perspective, show us your presence. Show us that you are with us, that you are for us, that you are leading the way, that you have been there before and you will not abandon us. But you go before us. And you go with us. God, we pray for your mercy, for your comfort, for your healing, for your provision, for all who are in need. And Lord God, as we come again before this communion table, we are reminded that all of us are a broken people, a people in need. We are sinners in need of a Savior. God, we come to the church not because we have it all figured out. No. We come here broken, begging for a piece of your grace, asking for your love and for your mercy, taking on your righteousness so that you will take away our sin. God, if we were left alone on our own, we'd continue to mess things up. But instead, you had a plan. You sent your son, Jesus. And he now stands in our place if we put our hope and trust in him. And you see us as forgiven, as spotless, as perfect and unblemished. Thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. God, continue to be with us as we move forward in worship. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name.